Um, so, like, once I got him up on Thursday, uh, it, was, it was kind of a later morning. It was around 6.40 whenever I got him up. And because uh, it was Heidi's first day to actually take Margot uh, by herself with the Asadas. <clears throat> so pretty much gave uh, Heidi a kiss, the baby a kiss, and um, Asadas a kiss, said have a wonderful day. Uh, left the apartment, uh, went to work. And then she takes the kids to school and she was, she was making lunch like right before I left. Uh, uh, she took the kids to school. I don't know. Uh, um, so uh, at around eight o'clock, uh, she called me. I answered the phone like right before I got in my truck. Uh, I work for Unicorn Moving. So, uh, she called me around eight and, uh, she told me that she went to the book fair. She bought three books, cost about $25. It was amazing. Like she couldn't wait to, uh, read to Silas. And, uh, I told her, I love you. Goodbye. And, uh, oh, man. this is hard. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Take your time. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't. <laughs> so, uh. Oh, man. <coughs> I, don't, I don't know right now. It's been repeating it all day. And let me know um, if you want me to move on to another question. No, no, it's a good question. I just. This is just a weird situation right here. Uh, I don't know. Uh. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science. In this episode we'll be doing statement analysis, uh, doing comparisons with the Chris Watts case and looking at the Facebook accounts and social media of... Shane Corey, an Irish American, and his fiancée, Heidi Brossard, uh, 33 years old, and her daughter, Margot Carey, who was just two weeks old when uh, she disappeared with her mother. This case is already making national and international headlines. There are reports in CBS Austin, the New York Post, Inside Edition, Irish Central, Crime Online, People, Oxygen.com, The Daily Beast, all over Facebook, all over Reddit, and also all over YouTube. There are also reports on NBC News, Heavy.com, Mao.com, TheBlaze.com, Fox News, KCRG, Cleveland 19, Cafe Mom, and so on. In other words, the story has already um, basically gone everywhere. It's also made news in the UK on the Daily Mail and the International Business Times. It's also on many other stations, MSN, Newsa, ABC Chicago, Yahoo.com, and so on. One reason for this um, coverage is because Shane Carey himself has made many um, television appearances, um, tearful appearances. That's one reason. Uh, the other reason is a lot of people are talking about the similarities to the Chris Watts case. Why is True Crime Rocket Science covering it? Well. We wouldn't be covering it if it wasn't um, suspicious. Probably the most suspic suspicious aspect of it is how the father sort of came to be aware that his wife and child had disappeared. And how that happened was he got a call from 
her son's elementary school and I won't be showing photos of any of the children just because of the YouTube kind of guidelines in that regard but there are quite a few young children in this story and that is certainly um, an important factor as we'll get to in a moment but in any event um, the father got a call from um, the elementary school uh, letting him know that the boy hadn't been picked up yet uh, Kerry then returned home after picking up um, her son and found that uh, his fiance and their baby daughter weren't home and he said that's when he got worried he didn't get worried when he got the call from the elementary sa school saying that his wife hadn't picked them up he got worried when he got home and even after he got home he didn't really do anything if we go to the timeline something happened in the morning just as it happened in the Chris Watts case this happened on a Thursday uh, five days ago um, at 8 a.m. Kerry says he spoke to Brassard on the phone at 1.40 um, Kerry says he tried calling Brassard this is obviously around about the time that he picked up um, the little boy and then uh, Kerry arrived home from work and didn't find their daughter there. So what I'm not completely clear about is did the school call home or did the school call him? Was he at home when the school called? I'm not quite clear on that. Um, in any event um, the little boy's name is Silas and um, I'm also not clear at this point whether it's his child or both of their, ch their children um, but there's another aspect in terms of the paternity that's even more significant which we'll get to in a second at 7.30 uh, which is a long time it's you know five and a half hours Kerry only reported Brassard and Margot missing to police so if we limited our scrutiny to just that, that would already be quite suspicious. But we're going to do some statement analysis and look at the social media of um, the people involved in this case. What we also notice is there's probably um, there was probably a custody issue going on. And I don't know if you've noticed, but if you think about just the simple um, mechanism of the mother drops Silas off at school and I think it was his first day at school not sure if it was his first ever day at school or if it was just his first day back at school but it was kind of a landmark thing in that that sense bear in mind in the Watts case it was also going to be um, Bella's first day back at school when had the impression it was sort of a, a kindergarten scenario that was different to when she she was last at school in any event it was some kind of big deal and so what happens is the mother takes the little boy to school and then she disappears with her child with her infant child and then what happens is because she's not there to pick up the little boy he does and so in that sense custody transfers in that moment from the mother to the father um, this is echoes of the Patrick Frazee case as well where Patrick Frazee picks up his child at the same time that the murder happens and that and then custody hearings follow during the criminal trial prior to and after so we're gonna certainly l focus on that as a potential um, possibility in this case obviously in a case like this it's very early days um, no one is um, <laughs> sorry it's the other way around everyone is innocent <laughs> until proven guilty I was gonna say no one is innocent but yeah uh, everyone is innocent uh, until proven guilty and so let's bear that in mind let's also bear in mind that this is a family tragedy um, we may treated almost as entertainment uh, you know the newest thing compared to Chris Watts it's not it's it certainly doesn't look good 
doesn't look good for the mother that's disappeared or her child and it also doesn't look good for the fiance um, and so let's bear that in mind um, this isn't the game this is real life real people and um, let's treat it with with that kind of um, sort of sober um, pers perspective if you're new to this channel uh, please subscribe like share leave a comment and let's get started so I think the first obvious point to make in terms of this man is that his father accompanies him so he has the obvious support of his father you know at his side when he's giving interviews uh, we didn't see that with Patrick Frazee or with um <coughs> sorry Chris Watts um, you didn't have someone standing kind of on camera supporting him the other very obvious thing to note is this guy's very emotional um, he, th there are real tears you can see tears running down his cheeks um, th but those aren't the only emotions There's, there are also moments of levity and laughter and almost relief and um, when he feels uncomfortable it's not because of what's happened to him it's because of being on camera and being asked to look into into the camera probably the most significant um, aspect in terms of the social media is that Shane Carey um, defines his relationship status as single and so this is also very important and also something that is related to both the Watts case and the Frazee case in the Watts case you had a marriage that was hanging in the balance and it was being pressured because of a pregnancy in the Frazee case you had custody hanging in the balance because the couple hadn't gotten married that had a child out of wedlock the mother is a very from a very religious family and they hadn't gotten married and so that the child was becoming kind of an issue as time was going on in this situation you have the same thing you have two people who are who haven't formalized their relationship and you have very young children that are sort of passing between them and that is causing pressure um, according to Facebook this couple had been together for 10 years on Heidi's Facebook she said that she'd met Corey um, sorry Carey in 20, uh, 2009 so they'd basically been together for 10 years and so obviously in their 10th year you're going to be asking what's going to happen what's going to happen are we going to get married are we what's going to happen to the children and so it seems like that may have been a very serious issue now whereas Heidi mentions um, meeting Carrie in 2009 she also highlights getting a pet Zeus in 2011 and having a child in 2013 and I think this is Silas um, she doesn't mention having Margot in 2019 I guess maybe she wasn't that active on Facebook but she had two weeks to indicate that um, on the other hand her not indicating that may have been a symptom of uncertainty around her child around their child when we look at Heidi's relationship status she isn't have any relationship information and the family members on her Facebook are quite few when we refer to um, Shane Carey's comments um, and I'm quoting them I've highlighted them in red here from the Daily Beast a lot of it feels familiar doesn't it a lot of it sounds familiar um, the main difference is Chris Watts didn't really say that Shanann was a great person or that um, that um, you know anything about that he did say like like Shane Carey was is saying here she needs to be back I need them back here 
um, he's also saying I don't know what else he, he's sort of saying that I'm not doing anything um, and I'm scared um, the part and I'm helpless the part that is um, significant I think is where he says I don't know if she's suffering now, if you look at those words she's suffering um, that is quite a jump to make from just someone not not being accounted for um, you know she may have disappeared she may have left or whatever it is but the fact that he uses that word suffering I think indicates um, potentially uh, inside knowledge it may also indicate his own suffering through this protracted situation with between their children it may mean that he was suffering he felt helpless and that uh, that was the worst feeling in the world and possibly because of that he took matters in his own hands we don't know it's early at this stage but it certainly um, appears as, as though that's a possibility when I first read the article on the Daily Beast um, nothing really stood out for a while until I got to where Kerry sort of arrived home at about two o'clock from work and he, he said he found the house empty just as Chris Watts did um, and just as Chris Watts said and uh, Brassard's phone was off and this was the part that stood out the fact that he th he said he thought nothing of it at the time so if you take that on its own you might say no big deal you know he couldn't get hold of his wife and Chris Watts said exactly the same thing Chris Watts also said you know he tried to contact his wife and she didn't answer and he thought well you know if she's not busy maybe she's busy with her friends and then he, remember he said the fact that she didn't get back to her people that's that was what worried him he wasn't worried but the fact that she didn't get back to her people that worried him and what that kind of acknowledged with the Chris Watts case was that things weren't very kosher with his wife and he kind of wanted people to know that he kind of wanted Kessinger probably if she was listening and she was to know that um, we don't know whether there's something like that going on here um, an affair um, I don't know how significant it is I know in the Patrick Frazee case it I think it was was somewhat relevant but certainly not very relevant the affair in the Chris Watts case was very relevant because he was married in this case neither of them were married um, so I, I wouldn't put that much emphasis on something like that but there certainly does seem to be um, trouble in let's call it paradise there, there does seem to be um, a hint here that um, something's not right and again if you look at it even in the narrow confines of him just um, finding no one at home and um, hide his phone off the fact that he says he thought nothing of it that's a problem it's an even bigger problem when you conflate that with the circumstances which is that he found out that she didn't pick up their son from work or from school um, I anybody any normal person would have thought something of that and would have been immediately activated and and probably from here you you need to go to was she a devoted mother you know did she always pick up her, her son from school or from wh wherever was she usually on time all that kind of stuff um, and probably you'll find that she did and so him thinking nothing of it is a kind of a way of saying to others um, that's not important you know um, but it is also why is she not with her phone just like Shanann Watts why is her car there and her phone there and her purse there but she's not there and why is one child missing but not the other child why is the little boy present and accounted for but not the little girl who's only two weeks old and, and what did the appearance of this little two week old child it's a new appearance a new expense a new obligation what impact did that have on everything and wouldn't it wouldn't the obvious answer be Heidi's become a mother again and now she wants she wants 
some certainty from the father that we're going to be together I'm going to look after you and it's possible that this disappearance is the answer to that question just as with Chris Watts and Patrick Frazee the disappearances those respective disappearances were the answer to what the male's intentions were in that scenario and what we've also got to then look at is why would he not want to go through the normal channels and once again also the same thing in the Watts case and the Frazee case is what was the financial circumstances like if he did now I've gotten different reports some reports say that Broussard's car had been left unlocked and some say that the door was left wide open um, I think I read one report that said the police couldn't confirm that the door was open um, but in any event you have a situation here where the car is being imputed as the area where foul play may have happened in other words that someone may maybe snatched them from the car but notice that the car is left behind a car is an, an expensive item something that can be resold something we know that Scott Peterson resold we know the car was left behind in the Chris Watts case we also know the um, vehicles of Kelsey Berith were left behind as well and so once again you have a car being left behind but the person disappearing and once again you also have Shane Carey kind of saying the fact that the car door was left open made him worry but he's, he didn't seem very worried that she didn't pick up their son that's not something that's registering with him that's not something he's emphasizing that's not something he's trying to draw attention to but it would with anybody else you would say well the fact that she didn't pick up um, our child um, something something serious has happened um, and why wouldn't she and all that kind of thing that whole sort of um, aspect but it seems like he doesn't want to take attention into that area according to the Daily Beast Kerry said we're all stumped because everything's over here the cars over here there's no signs of struggle there's nothing no evidence so we're trying to piece it together but there really are no pieces so you know if what he said earlier raised a red flag about him thinking nothing of it at the time then this part is also kind of weird um, also bear in mind if he says something like well we thought nothing of it at the time but then when he appears on TV he is very emotional that doesn't look like someone who's thinking nothing of it um, if Chris Watts had to say that you know I didn't think much of it at the time and he appears the way that Chris Watts appeared they kind of align with each other but to say I thought nothing of it at the time but then to break out crying it's not necessarily something but there does seem to be a little bit of a mismatch between um, between the the actions and the words someone said on reddit as well that um, you know compared to um, Shane Carey uh, Chris Watts sh should get an Oscar um, I kind of agree with that I, I, I think that um, Carey seems very weird he seems very odd um, whereas Chris Watts seemed um, less odd certainly at face value the, the very first time we looked at him um, he just seemed too nonchalant whereas Carey seems if anything too emotional and his, his um, emotion is, isn't just a little inappropriate it's extremely inappropriate there's big smiles and a lot of awkwardness um, I'm sure you've all watched the video if not go and look at um, the Crime Rocket 2 blog I put some stuff there for those who want to look at it um, but there's a lot of very very weird um, also swaying from side to side um, laughter um, gravitas tears and and um, just it's all very very strange when he speaks to the media he doesn't provide anything helpful he doesn't give a description of what they were wearing 
he doesn't, uh, well, not one that I heard, uh, he doesn't give a number to call, he doesn't um, uh, provide any kind of contact details, neither did Chris Watts. This is a very tricky area to go into just because we know so little about um, the circumstances and the job and the identity and the backstory of these people. So it's very dangerous and tricky to start thinking in this area, to speculate. But um, we are going to do that to some extent and we're going to just look at some of these words like we're all stumped. Now the word stumped is kind of an unusual word. Um, it might be a word that this guy uses often because he's Irish American. It might just be his vernacular. Um, but to me it's a word that triggers true crime um, impressions. Um, stumped is kind of a almost a sound, almost like a sound of wood on bone or bone on wood or whatever it is. Um, it's something that one associates with an amputation, someone who has stumps instead of limbs. Um, it's, it, it also invokes this idea of impact on the head. And again, like I say, um, this could be reading far too much into something, but um, but it may not be. It just that word stands out as a as an unusual word. That word, and what he's saying through that word is he's saying, because of the lack of evidence, everyone is stumped. Everyone almost is unable to think almost as if they've been hit, hit on the head and they're unable to process information. And so that, that simply registered with me in the same way that with Chris Watts I said, when he said, um, um, I think he said something about earth shattering and I'm, I'm, this is tearing me apart. Those words seem to invoke something um, to do with broken earth, which it turned out to be true, and also um, the limbs being um, torn or whatever in some way and, and that is what happened when they were pushed through the, the, the hatch. So it may be something, it may not be something, but it certainly stands out. The other aspect that stands out to me just in terms of the semantics is where he says, he doesn't just say there's nothing, he says no evidence and, and that seems to indicate that that's what he's thinking about. And this is where the alarm bells really start clanging and the red flags really start fluttering. Because why is he thinking of evidence if he is innocent? Why is he using that word? Why is his mind even in that place about evidence? So if he said something like, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing to indicate blah, 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 um, even that would be a little bit dodgy um, because it would be better if he said, I'm trying to convince you to look for my wife and child and what I can tell you is that, that and that. Not, there's nothing. Not going on TV to say, you know, that kind of thing. Another thing he says is there's no signs of a struggle. That's also volunteering something that could mean that he had insight, ins insight or inside information into. And so... Um, the idea of a struggle seems to suggest... Um, something other than um, if, if God forbid something has happened to his fiance then what that is more likely to be than not and again I, I say this with with, uh, with with caution because we don't know that something has there, there could be some other explanation but what these words seem to be indicating is some kind of bloodless struggle, so not a stabbing, not a, um, uh, what do you call it, not a um, shooting, but some kind of silent struggle, and so that could be strangulation or, or, or being hit by some kind of blunt object, um, but him, s him s seeming to be so sure that there's no signs of a struggle. Um, certainly evokes the Chris Watts case far more than the Frazee case. The Chris Watts case also had no signs of a struggle. We know what the method of 
um, execution was there. The Frazee um, uh, case was a huge um, bloodbath, um, and even though it had all been dis- uh, all, all been cleaned up, there were there were incredibly um, there, there were a lot of signs of the struggle. Ultimately, there was a lot of missing. Um, uh, aspects and and things that were burnt and all that kind of thing so um, so that's the one aspect to address with that again everything I'm saying here needs to be just appreciated within a very very narrow context that we don't know anything and um, it may be 30% accurate or it may be 80% accurate but don't read too much into it because it's based on very little um, knowledge and it may be completely wrong um, then the other aspect that he refers to which is very worrying is where he says we are just trying to piece it together but there really are no pieces and again this kind of colorful language is um, is is worrying because of the way that he's visualizing um, in talking about his family is, is thinking about things like being stumped, no signs of, of struggle, or put it this way, stumped, struggle, and pieces. And um, that is, that's, that's definitely um, reason to be, uh, to, to prick up one's ears. Um, he uses the word no evidence and then piece and pieces uh, very close together in that one sentence and you know I find when I make these YouTube videos I often say things that are in my mind that I'm thinking about um, without intending to say them and what's happening is your subconscious links things to things that are going on in your head w- no, irrespective of what you're saying or trying to say your your subconscious is kind of authentic and trying to be accurate and so the words one ch- one chooses reveals a lot about where one's subconscious mind actually is in another sentence Kerry says I, I just don't see why no one heard any screams or anything out here so we're trying to put the puzzle pieces together but but notice the words he uses I don't see why no one heard any screams and that's another aspect he seems to know that there weren't any screams and he seems to know that screams were kind of to be expected he's already resigned himself to a struggle suffering pieces and all that kind of thing so again it's just getting worse and worse and worse um, in the Chris Watts case there were no screams in the Frazee case um, there, there may have been um, some some words during the the struggle um, but certainly not enough to raise the alarm um, But this does seem to suggest that um, inside inside knowledge that there weren't screams, and in other words, it, that would have to be a, a silent kill if that was the case. And if that is the case, then we're looking at a uh, scenario similar to Chris Watts um, strangling something like that. Certainly a possibility. And once again he refers to we are trying to put the puzzle pieces together and this repeated use of these terms seems to be um, someone who's anticipated the idea of putting piece putting pieces together but in advance and so what it suggests is a premeditated um, scenario just like what's and like phrase Z. it's hard to say whether it goes further than that you know whether it's just that psychology or whether the references to puzzle pieces and trying to put pieces um, together has got something to do with um, human remains it's difficult to say
The other aspect that corresponds to both the Watts and Frazee case is the uh, victim's mother. And I say victim in the sense here that um, whatever happened to Heidi, um, I don't think it's good. Like the fact that she's disappeared, um, I think makes her a victim. So I mean it in that sense. She may be a victim in, in a disappearance, but she may also be a victim in something more serious. But in both cases, with Chris Watts and um, Patrick Frazee, the victims, mothers, lived somewhere else. Um, Shanann's folks stayed in North Carolina. Um, Kelsey's mother stayed in Washington. And then one of the most significant aspects that seems to show a homicide and I apologize for using that word but it, it does seem justified um, based on on these terms here um, Kerry says that he'd been going through dumpsters looking for clues and what that strongly implies is that he wasn't looking for um, um, l anything alive he was looking for trash he was looking for people bodies in trash and that suggests very strongly where his mind is what he's thinking about what he knows in um, the Patrick Frazee case Frazee also went to a Verizon store to check on the phone records of Kelsey Barrett and I don't know whether this guy was following that case but it seems he also went to a mobile store to get um, Heidi's phone records. And uh, it will be interesting to know whether the police have re retrieved them. It will be interesting to see his phone records, if he's deleted any messages. Um, I think that will basically be the bottom line, is if he hands over his phone and her phone and, and everything is completely normal, no deleted messages, um, then then that would strongly um, support his innocence. On the other hand, if um, the cell phone and browser history points to other things going on, um, custody issues, um, worries about um, infidelity, well then it's, um, it's, it's, it's I think going to be a, a, a tough a tough few weeks for um, this guy. It would be very interesting to know whether Carey himself has knowledge of Chris Watts. Um, I would love to see where someone has maybe said to him, you know, this case is a lot like the Chris Watts case and how he responds. Um, but it's hard to imagine that he wouldn't know about the Chris Watts case. It's also hard to imagine that he wouldn't have heard of the Patrick Frazee case. If he has heard from them, um, it looks like he's learned the lesson of show emotion and so Chris, um, Kerry is showing a, a heck of a lot of emotion but that doesn't mean he's off the hook showing emotion doesn't mean you're off the hook it's showing appropriate emotion showing grief saying the right things doing the right things and unfortunately in this instance Kerry doesn't seem to be doing either of those and so seemingly um, harmless uh, random tidbit of information I think is very 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 significant in this case and it's mentioned uh, in a report by CBS Austin and it refers to um, Heidi's co-workers at um, Cracker Barrel in Buda who say that um, Heidi's taken off work since having a baby. So Heidi hasn't worked for two weeks. And this situation also echoes not only the Chris Watts case, but also the Patrick Frazee case. Shanann um, quit her, her, her regular job um, to do the whole Thrive thing, which most people, well, I think a lot of people acknowledge um, probably wasn't earning the kind of money that the family needed. Um, but the fact that she quit her job and that she was about to give birth 
um, is, I think, significant. Um, I know a lot of people argue and say that she was earning just as much as her husband. I, I don't think that's the case. Um, and the debt seems to prove that of the Watts family. In the Patrick Frazee case, we have exactly the same thing. We have um, Kelsey um, working part-time um, at DOS Aviation, so cutting down her hours, and as a result, her situation at work changed because of her part-time status. Her insurance and health benefits were changing, and um, obviously um, the reliance on Frazee to kind of pick up the checks and to look after them would have increased. And then it turned out that Frazee also had $72,000 in debt in the sense that he'd taken out a loan and it had matured um, literally two weeks after the murder. So here we also have a situation where um, they haven't formalized their relationship Bear in mind, Frazee and his fiance hadn't either. And the introduction of a new expense, a new child in the equation, um, means that there's going to be a financial um, burden. And if you add to that burden the fact that the mother doesn't work, or is working less, that puts more pressure on the father. And if the father and the mother aren't in a solid relationship, in a solid dynamic, in a solid committed relationship, and they weren't. And that's that's the same across all three cases. Chris Watts and Shanann, Patrick Frazee and Kelsey, Shane, Carey and Heidi, all three of them, the, the status of their relationship was kind of in flux. And within that um, dynamic, you have another child either imminent or um, recently born or um, the status of that child um, under um, sort of in, in a legal contest. In Frazee's case the child was um, just over a year old. So in, if you take just the ages of the children, Chris Watts, 15 week old fetus, 15 week old unborn child. Um, uh, the gender of this child about to be announced, the um, paternity of this child about to be confirmed. In the Frazee case, a one-year-old little girl called Kaylee. In this case, a two-week-old little girl. And so you can see how the, the children are adding pressure, not only financial but commitment pressures, social pressures to these respective men and the men for whatever reason don't want to be attached to the mothers in this case and some of them don't want to be attached to s to the children um, and I just want to wrap up just by emphasizing this point that in terms of um, criminal psychology I think the biggest aspect that stood out to me was uh, in this report where they said that he got a call from her son's elementary school. Um, I, I don't know if it isn't their son's. It seems like it is their child. Silas is their child. But for uh, whatever reason, um, uh, Kerry said he, he didn't get worried um, when he found out that she didn't pick up Silas. He got worried when um, no one had spoken to her all day. In other words, it took him five and a half hours to get worried. Um, that seems weird. And it would be interesting to look at his phone records between, well, for, for basically for that whole day. And more than likely, that is what the police have been focusing on. What we really want to look at here is his alibi. Does he have an alibi for that Thursday? Um, what time did he arrive at work according to his colleagues? What time did he leave work according to his colleagues? When we compare his demeanor to Chris Watts, and a lot of people have, um, 
it seems like he has far less of a story and a strategy than Chris Watts. Like Chris Watts um, seemed to not have very much game and didn't seem to have his story very straight. But this guy's far worse. He doesn't seem to know what to say to the media. He seems to want to bail out of a question halfway. He doesn't seem to even capable of putting his face on camera for, for even a few seconds. He doesn't seem to be capable of um, doing the thing of um, even whether it's pretending to um, you know ask for help from the media or, or to genuinely ask for help from the media he doesn't seem capable of either meanwhile they have announced um, a fundraiser on Facebook uh, I think 14 people have contributed they've raised I think a thousand four hundred dollars to date with a aim of ten thousand dollars uh, according to the family, I think they want to use the funds for hiring a private investigator. And I think they just talk about all sorts of expenses. I think it's very significant that um, at this early time, they're already asking the public for money. Um, my personal impression is uh, that money is going to be going to a lawyer. So the True Crime Rocket Science assessment for this case would be to um, really just to highlight um, most of the most significant aspects in the Chris Watts and the Patrick Frazee case, which is money issues, um, relationship status that is not um, concrete, not established, not formalized, and then child custody um, issues that are also not clear as a result of the foregoing. So it's basically um, money is a, is a huge um, factor, appears to be a huge factor in this case. Relationship status appears to be a huge factor and child custody appears to be a huge factor. Uh, what's also interesting to mention is that um, the ages of the victims, Shanann Heidi and Kelsey were all very similar, probably all within um, two to three, maybe four years at the most of each other. Um, also the ages of the perpetrators are very close to each other. Um, I'm not yet sure what the age is of Shane Carey, so I'd appreciate any of you who do know just leaving that in a comment. And the final thing I want to emphasize is just some statement analysis by Peter Hyatt. He highlights that uh, the lack of a personal pronoun uh, is indica indicative of a bad relationship with the mother. This does seem to be the case. Um, Hyatt also highlights the repeated sort of um, words saying how amazing she is and that the last thing that he said to her was that he loved her. He doesn't say anything about what she said to him um, but this um, assurance, these repeated assurances seem to be um, almost like making excuses for, um, for something and it may be that he's trying to convince the public that the relationship was a lot better than it really was. In this respect Peter Hyatt refers to um, him using hyperbolic language um, in order to ingratiate himself, uh, to portray himself as the good guy and I think that's quite, um, quite uh, astute of him to notice. And then besides this um, Peter Hyatt also refers to money pressures and avoiding saying his fiance's name. I do notice that when he says names he seems to become quite tearful and that seems to confirm to me um, that he's triggered in terms of a custody scenario. I think just saying their names reminds him of the struggle that he's gone through in terms of what's going to happen with his children. Okay, so that's almost 50 minutes worth. It's far more than I wanted to say, given the little bit of information that we have. Um, but there's certainly reason for concern. Um, and our hearts certainly go out to Heidi's 
family and uh, True Crime Rocket Science will be monitoring this case going forward. Thank you for listening. If you haven't subscribed, please do. Um, please like, share, leave a comment. And uh, thank you for the folks on Patreon for bringing this uh, case to my attention. Tomorrow on Patreon I'll be continuing with the Atkinson Transcripts, Episode 3. So I'll see you guys then.